Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Officer. Uh, my name is Pani Galazopoulou. I'm coming from the Aristotle uh, University, and I represent the, Not the Nautilus Project Partners, which are the Surf Club Keros, our coordinator, Kite Pirates and Kite Turkey, uh, Tube Austria, and Learn Boards. So my presentation is about Nautilus, the education and certification framework for water sports tourism professionals. You will hear about our project, our challenge, our target group, the training objectives, the methodology, our training scenario, the pilot implementation, the expected outcomes, and future directions. Nautilus project is a 36-month project funded by the European Maritime Fisheries Fund under the Blue Economy Code. It is actually a university business collaboration in Southeast Mediterranean Basin and it is a partnership between three uh, water sports tourism SMEs, a public university, an IT company, and an accreditation and certification organization. Our aim is to renew education and training curricula for the blue careers in water sports tourism. So why not use? Because people working in the water sports tourism industry are mostly mobile and seasonal workers with different background knowledge. Uh, they are water sports instructors without knowledge about the local environment, the local human, natural, and cultural environment. And there is not enough time or no structured plan to train or educate this diverse workforce type. And another issue is the safety. First aid skills need to be updated every two years. So our target group are the water sports instructors. According to the International Labour Organization, this occupational category is uh, together with the fitness instructors, coaches, and all sport instructors. But we argue that they are more than that. They are working in the tourism industry. They provide and facilitate tourism experiences. And we all know from the tourism industry that Tourism experiences are the ones that influence uh, future travel intentions and the willingness of travelers to promote destinations. So water sports instructors have to interact in a specific environment, in their working environment, to act in a professional way, to collaborate with their colleagues, to know all the products and services that they have to promote. They have to interact with the local community, the local human, natural, and cultural environment. And they have to interact with their customers. And who are these customers? The water sports tourists, a very diverse group. The age ranges from 8 to 80. And not only the age, but also their uh, preferences, their wishes, their expectations, their abilities, their needs and also their travel motivations. Others travel for fun, others travel for relaxation, others travel uh, to have a sense of community, to uh, experience some risks and challenges, and others just uh, travel to share the time with their family. So, so uh, the water sports instructors have to interact with all these people and they have to develop so many skills, communication skills, soft skills, teaching skills, marketing skills, management skills. So having started this target group, we have designed the Nautilus training program. And the objectives of this training program are to provide the basic theoretical knowledge in hospitality and water sports tourism industry, practical training in customer service, practical training and technical knowledge in water sports training for recreational purposes because we're not training for the Olympics. We're just sharing the fun. So it is water sports for recreational purposes and this is something completely different. Another objective is a deeper understanding of the green and blue environment and its preservation. It's a unique opportunity. Those people working with children and families and youth to be able to raise awareness about the preservation of our coastal environments and the aquaculture. 
And the last uh, objective is to have a better understanding of the essential role of the water sports instructors in tourism and how this affects the companies and the travel destinations reputation. So this is how we um, uh, did it. This is the methodology that we have used. We have used all available academic and research tools to do the job descriptions and analysis. We interviewed and we used questionnaires to all stakeholders to analyze the skills needs, the training and learning needs. We defined the Nautilus reputational profile. We defined the learning objectives and outcomes. We suggested a teaching and learning strategy and a training delivery mode. And finally, we proposed an assessment method. After that, we uh, completed, we uh, designed and developed the content. We did three pilot training camps and then we evaluated their effectiveness. And now we are in the final stage and we are uh, completed, uh, we are improving the content and uh, soon we will have the final training program. Our training scenario is modular, is hybrid, and blends online with workplace training. The online training program employs a self-paced and self-regulated learning strategy. We use audiovisual materials, presentations, case studies, case scenarios, infographics, reports, and publications. And the skills-based workplace training uh, uses mostly simulations, hands-on trainings, and team-based field workshops. The Nautilus online training modules are five, and they consist of more sub-modules. The first one is about water sports, tourism, and hospitality. We focus mostly on cross-water sports knowledge. Um, a new challenge of the decade is the climate change that affects these tourism products. For example, wind-based destinations with wind-based water sports have to provide alternative services and products in non-wind days. So water sports instructors with only one certification in a, only one water sport is no more enough. Um, the second module is about tourism management. The third one is about tourism marketing because there are services and products to promote and to sell, to offer uh, tourism experiences. The uh, fourth module is about soft skills, communication skills, all the useful skills that professionals have to develop to work um, in a company and in a very decent environment. And finally, we have the last module, the environment and sustainability module. And this has to do with general knowledge about coastal environments and aquaculture knowledge that can be applied in all destinations. So water sports tourists, uh, professionals that uh, have this knowledge can uh, recognize in every spot they are working similar characteristics and they will know and they will be able to raise awareness about the preservation of a specific destination. So uh, we implemented three pilot camps. Uh, the first one was on Limnos Island in Greece. Uh, the second one was in Turkey in Cesme, Alacate. And the third one was in Italy in Sicily in Pozzalo. We focused more on safety, on first aid skills, and we did many uh, experiential tasks and proactive and reactive um, uh, drills uh, regarding risk management. Now, we are in the evaluation phase. We evaluated all the content. Uh, we um, proceeded to assessment to all um, uh, after all uh, training camps. And what we expect? We expect a training program and a certification. What we actually do with Nautilus is we provide the opportunity for fair education for all water sports instructors that want to reskill and upskill and become water sports tourism professionals. Nautilus invites all water sports instructors to become water sports tourism professionals with self, with increased self-esteem, able to advance their careers in the tourism and hospitality industry. Nautilus invites 
all water sports instructors to become local ambassadors and being able to promote travel destinations. Nautilus invites all water sports instructors to become environment engagers who will raise awareness about the preservation and protection of the coastal and maritime environment. For the future, we are seeking for partnerships. We are seeking for partnerships to co-design our twin transition in the coastal tourism industry. This is a collaborative project uh, process and no one has to be left behind. So our project is complete, it will be completed in the next two months and um, all results will be public and we will be more than happy to provide you with any information you would like to know. Thank you very much. Uh, as they comply in fact with the principles that the scheme uh, sets. Um, uh, before I continue, allow me uh, to uh, present myself. Um, I'm uh, the head of the R&D uh, department and division, in fact, of, of T. Foster Hellas and also one of the members of the technical committee uh, that have developed the scheme that I'm going to present you um, uh, soon. Um, in fact, I would like also to say, if you allow me, that this certification scheme could be a point of reference uh, for synergies uh, with the outcomes of the uh, Nautilus project, uh, aiming to further, if possible, uh, and strengthen uh, the, um, the safety for the users of the water sports and to promote also the, um, the differentiation and I would say the distinction of the certified um, water sports centers um, that they provide services in their market. So, um, to start with, um, I would say that, uh, as I already mentioned, the Water Sport Certified Quality uh, is a customized um, uh, certification standard uh, that has been developed by Tifostria Hellas uh, um, that holds, I would say, the, uh, the know-how on developing customized um, uh, specialized services uh, with the implicit um, collaboration and support of the non-profit uh, organization uh, Save Water Sports um, and also the contribution, uh, the valuable contribution of um, a number of experienced uh, members of water sports centers that operate in Greece and also we have the uh, support uh, of the uh, Hellenic uh, Coast Guard. Uh, allow me at this point to mention very, very briefly uh, that the non-profit organizations Save Water Sports that actually uh, support this uh, development and give us um, the um, awareness and uh, um, support on uh, legislati legislative topics regarding uh, marine uh, and uh, water sport uh, facilities um, has been uh, um, uh, founded in uh, 2015 uh, by the parent of a kid that in fact lost his life uh, back in 2011 when he was uh, having fun with his friends uh, on uh, water sports activities in a Greek island. Um, therefore, the um, Save Water Sports, um, in fact, uh, after its uh, foundation, uh, has as its main, uh, let's say, purpose and uh, aim to uh, um, raise awareness um, to uh, the general public and uh, specifically, of course, on, on, safety, um, on safety matters related to um, recreational uh, water activities and specifically uh, water sports, um, giving great emphasis um, also on uh, safety standards and the uh, prevention of uh, drawing or even uh, any kind of accident, uh, accidents in, uh, in the sea. Um, the Water Sport Certified um, uh, Quality Certification has been launched, in fact, in uh, 2016 
Um, and as I said, um, this scheme won the recognition of the central management of the Hellenic Coast Guard um, as a standard uh, that support the uh, overall targets um, of the Coast Guard authorities to uh, upgrade um, the services of uh, the water sports uh, in Greece. Um, currently and so far the, uh, the water sports certified uh, quality scheme uh, remains, uh, I would say, an innovative uh, certification protocol uh, for water sports uh, centers at a European level and in fact has been launched in 2017 when uh, we had uh, the first uh, certified um, uh, companies uh, in Greece. Um, so, um, which are the, uh, the objectives of, uh, of this certification scheme of the Foster Hellas? Um, the scheme has, I would say, two uh, primary uh, objectives. Um, the first, the primary objective is to um, reliably and impartially evaluate uh, and give prominence uh, to the responsiveness uh, of the licensed water sports centers uh, against critical requirements concerning the quality uh, of the uh, services that these service uh, these centers uh, provide to safeguard their high levels of responsibility against uh, their uh, users and needs with reference to advanced services that they uh, receive and their overall uh, I would say safety. Um, this way, somebody could also say that the scheme aims further to support the business viability uh, of the uh, certified uh, water sport centers. The uh, secondary objective of the uh, water sports uh, certified quality scheme is to assure that the certified water sport centers implement a documented mechanism that allows for continuous improvement and upgrade of their services uh, to further uh, support the uh, primary objective of the scheme. Okay, so let's see uh, which is the scope of the scheme. Um, the scheme uh, apparently covers all the water sports activities, the motorized ones and the non-motorized ones for which the water sports centers uh, hold a valid operating license from the port authorities. Some of these activities uh, which are known to all of us uh, are depicted in this slide. Uh, it is important however to underline from my side that the structure of the scheme and specifically the structure of the audit requirements of the scheme uh, allows the competent uh, audit team of the certification body to assess effectively the achievement of the objectives of our scheme uh, in every type of water uh, sport activities regardless of whether the water sport centers provide motorized or non-motorized water sports. It is worth noting uh, also that this standard does not apply to activities such as diving for example or boat rental or other kind of water activities that take place outside sea uh, such as for example activities in water parks. Okay. Um, let's see uh, which are actually uh, the pillars uh, under which the, um, stand uh, the, um, the requirements of the standards underlie. Um, I will start by saying that first of all the standard sets uh, specialized requirements that are based on and complement both the Greek um, uh, legislation, uh, the Greek legislative framework uh, and the international water sports good practices and guidance that exist which support uh, compliance with quality and safety issues. Um, it should be noted, and I would like to underline that, that the requirements and the criteria of the standard do not replace, do not replace the requirements which are set by the legislative framework 
uh, and for which every um, water sports center should comply with. And this is, in fact, a prerequisite for us in order to continue any kind of cooperation with uh, water sports uh, centers. Um, therefore, um, the uh, requirements, as I said, uh, that the standard sets uh, underlie six pillars. The first pillar, uh, in fact, uh, sets requirements um, for the orderliness, uh, I would say, of the water sports centers and their smooth and professional uh, operation uh, in a daily uh, base. Um, the second pillar defines the competencies and the, uh, that the, competencies, the competencies that the responsible staff of the water sports center should gather and also specifies which are their, resp their responsibilities when they provide the water sports services. The, the, uh, the third pillar uh, sets a number of uh, representative uh, requirements that support um, a water sport center to provide, I would say, advanced water sports uh, services of high performance uh, with focus uh, mostly on safety. The fourth pillar determines the list of the needed infrastructure that a water sport center should maintain in order to provide quality services, including uh, also supportive equipment uh, for rescue and for sure uh, for first aid. Um, the fifth pillar uh, sets the requirements for uh, a water sports center to um, better host, uh, we can say, uh, its clients uh, at its premises as well as for evaluating the adequacy of the uh, supportive facilities to um, allow for an increased experience to uh, their users. And finally, uh, the sixth pillar uh, that defines the um, needed actions uh, that a water sport center should maintain to achieve a continuous improvement uh, of the uh, provided uh, services. The audit criteria of, uh, of our scheme are distincted into two categories, uh, I could say. Um, the first category, with, uh, in fact, contains the 66 fundamental requirements that a water sport center should comply with, and this is the minimum in order to get a certification. And the second category of the requirements that, in fact, contains the 45 optional as we call them, leading requirements that allow for an advanced rating um, for a water sport center to further, um, if you uh, would like to say, to differentiate its services um, in, in the market. The, um, the advanced rating allows, in fact, for three distinct, as I said, uh, uh, certification categories uh, for a water sports center um, to, uh, to achieve beyond the basic certification. And these uh, three distinct certification categories uh, are the bronze certification uh, that is awarded to uh, the centers that comply with 10 to 40% uh, of the leading requirements that the uh, standard sets. Um, the silver, uh, the middle, actually, uh, certification category is awarded to um, the water sports centers that comply with a percentage of uh, uh, 41 to 75 uh, percent of the leading requirements of the scheme. And finally, um, the highest, let's say, um, certifying category, uh, the gold uh, certification that is awarded to those uh, water sports centers that comply with a percentage of more than 75% of the uh, leading requirements of the scheme. Um, let's have a look uh, um, at this point uh, on the process uh, that somebody uh, should follow, uh, I mean a water sports center, to follow uh, in order to get uh, the water sports certified uh, quality certification from uh, Tifostria. First of all, um, the process starts 
uh, with the uh, submission of the application form of the waters of the interested, in fact, water sports center to uh, the certification body Tifostria Hellas. Um, the certification body then takes all the actions to um, appropriately uh, plan the audit and to guide, in fact, the uh, water sports center to uh, uh, get prepared to host the, um, uh, uh, the initial certification audit at, uh, at its premises. Um, at a date that the water sport center will, uh, will fully operate, um, the uh, lead auditor of, of, of the uh, audit team uh, of the certification body will agree with the certification center to implement, to conduct the on-site audit at the premises of the water sport center. Um, after the, um, the water sport center complete and submit to the certification body any needed uh, corrective actions based on the findings of, of the audit, um, the, certifica the certification body's uh, reviewer um, actually uh, takes steps forward to uh, assess the report of uh, the lead auditor uh, that conducted the audit. And in case uh, the certification decision of the reviewer is positive, uh, then the uh, certification body issues and awards um, the certificate to um, the Water Sports Center, uh, a certificate that uh, it should be uh, noted that has a validity for one calendar year. Um, after the issuance of the certificate, and in order for the certification body to safeguard that the certified center uh, fully complies with um, the requirements and the principles of the scheme uh, at the daily base after uh, its initial certification, uh, has the rights and holds the rights, in fact, to uh, conduct, as we call them, integrity audits, which could be um, unannounced audits or mystery shopping audits, uh, which are actually um, um, scheduled uh, based on a risk assessment approach. And, of course, um, a full on-site uh, recertification audit is conducted uh, at an annual base, um, and uh, the date uh, uh, that, is, uh, that this audit is scheduled is close to the due uh, date of, uh, of the certificate, of the valid certificate uh, that the company holds. And as you can understand, the process goes on uh, that way. Finally, and in order to, to help users, uh, that would like to have uh, quality uh, water sports activities uh, from the uh, certified water sports centers. Uh, in fact, we uh, suggest for a two-step process for them in order to uh, understand which are the certified uh, companies, uh, which are the certified um, centers, water sports centers under our scheme. The first step that somebody should take is to look uh, for the flag, for the certification flag uh, in the beach uh, that the uh, certified um, water sports centers uh, hold. And secondly, and this is the most important topic, to check uh, not only the validity of the certificate, but also the scope that is written on the certificate for the water sports center, uh, a certificate that the company, the certified water sports center, should maintain at its premises. So um, this is briefly uh, the context of, uh, of the water sports scheme of, of the Foster Hellers, um, a scheme um, that has currently uh, achieved to certify more than 45 um, water sports centers in Greece, uh, despite the, um, I would say, the difficulties that we all have faced the last three years due uh, to the pandemic. Hoping, however, that the, we will have more uh, water sports centers in the future to become ambassadors also to this initiative uh, for quality and safety uh, water sports in the near future. So I feel I'm on time. Thank you very much, and I'm, I will be glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Kostas. Um, 
The next speaker is from another successful project in uh, um, Blue Careers. Uh, he's a scuba diver, and he will talk us about uh, very interesting things underwater. Um, good morning. Thank you, Odysseus, and thank you all organizers for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to be here uh, not uh, as an academic. <laughs> Uh, I'm working at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, but uh, rather as a diving instructor that uh, uh, this uh, experience I had uh, some 30 years ago allowed me to get in the 70% of our uh, world uh, underwater and uh, actually start uh, practicing uh, my scientific uh, knowledge and skills uh, there and also providing training. Today I'm not going to say many things about the project uh, that uh, was the uh, opportunity to meet uh, the group of uh, your project, uh, rather uh, on the activities uh, that uh, we are doing and the training challenges that uh, uh, has to do with uh, the coastal and nautical tourism. And uh, for, of course, this is also part of our project, but uh, I, the reason I'm not going to say more uh, many things about the project is uh, it's not at the final uh, point yet, uh, although we have done uh, a lot of progress. Now, uh, we may move on the next uh, slides, please, or uh, I can use the button. Yes. Okay, okay, the middle one. Eh? Okay, why diving? Uh, it is a touristic activity. This is th that was the reason that I got involved in diving uh, for recreational purposes. And that's why I'm here today. It is a mode of tourism. It is actually a mode of accessing places that we couldn't reach in another way. And uh, there is a whole industry, the diving industry. Uh, the branding of uh, some destinations is based on this activity. And uh, also there are standardized services that are provided, like uh, the previous uh, speaker told. Uh, but it is also a mean of uh, research. It is uh, a way to approach the site of uh, the, uh, some scientist applying uh, his uh, knowledge or getting information, gather data. Uh, it is the only way to be present uh, at the underwater environment and doing uh, some things. And it has to do with uh, the scientific diving, what our project uh, is uh, working on. And also with technology development, either for uh, scientific purposes or for uh, the market. Uh, and uh, actually it is uh, a passport to the 70% of the globe. And this is related with uh, what is going on uh, this decade, declared by the United Nations as the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, and also related with all blue economy activities and the related market. And this market relies a lot on what is called blue skills. Now, some things about uh, the underwater natural and cultural heritage using the example of uh, Greece because we are here and I think the topic of this uh, meeting was to, to do what we can, what may follow from uh, the, all those synergies and uh, meetings like that. As you can see, I don't know if I may use this, okay, the pointer, Greece is in the 11th place in the world after some countries like Canada, Indonesia, Russia, uh, with a coastline of uh, 13, almost 14,000 uh, kilometers, although it is a relatively sl uh, small country, I think in this list only Denmark is uh, smaller than Greece, the others you can see the area, and that uh, makes it uh, a very um, popular destination for this coastline. This is the tourism industry, how it works. And on the next two maps, this is part of our work we are doing, we can see 
an amount uh, all over the, the Greece uh, territory, let's say, there are more than uh, 30, those are 239 marine protected areas that has to do with uh, environmental uh, particularities uh, that would be protected, like the marine park here at Sporades, which is the biggest one in the Mediterranean, in the most extended one, and also the marine mammals protected areas that can cover more or less major part of the south part of Greece, but also northern parts here. That it doesn't mean that there are no other, let's say, valuable assets uh, in terms of uh, natural assets uh, at uh, the Greek territory. Those are declared and protected by uh, international or uh, local uh, national regulations or uh, treats. Uh, regarding the cultural heritage, uh, there are 197, almost 200 uh, declared by law underwater archaeological sites, but uh, for sure this is not uh, the list that includes every archaeological site. And uh, recently we have an announcement of 91 historical wrecks from ship ships and aircrafts over the Aegean, and I have added uh, on the map here uh, the position of those uh, wrecks because they are, it is something we don't know exactly. The, the, the declarations for those uh, monuments does not provide this information and it is important to know where it is. And um, also some uh, other wrecks that uh, are coastal ones and one may visit uh, from the shore. Uh, why I'm uh, insisting on, in, on the wrecks? Because let me go to the next topic. This is um, a main interest of our team at the university uh, because Rex are uh, an attraction, first of all. They can uh, brand, let's say, a destination like the Brita Britannic in uh, Kea or like other Rex, Tisseldorf or any other known Rex. Uh, but also it has a value both in cultural terms and environmental terms. It is becoming an artificial reef, uh, attracts a lot of life. Divers also is kind of life that are being attracted by wrecks. And uh, it gives, it provides opportunity for information, awareness, education, and participation in uh, scientific uh, activities or uh, tourist activities. So the aim of uh, our team is to provide safe and responsible approaches to those uh, heritage sites, underwater heritage sites, either natural or cultural. And particular objectives is to provide documentation, what is where, uh, to promote by presentations or uh, storytelling of those uh, uh, assets, and uh, provide also training. Uh, that has to do with knowledge and uh, skills. Uh, there is a so very short video just showing someone working underwater. I don't know if I can play this. It is uh, one minute, or I can just skip it if it is not. Eh? Can I play? I have to push. Is it the button? No. Okay, sorry. How can I go back? I'm not sure how. Okay, I can move on the next. Can I play this? No, okay. Okay, it just showing someone uh, from our team working underwater for the purposes uh, for documentation, representation, and uh, this is also something that we do for training. Now, regarding documentation, this is the way we are documenting. And one can see the, the spots here. It is the track of the diver that uh, took uh, some thousands of photos to produce this three model, 3D model. Uh, next. OK. This, those are some ways to promote what we are doing, what is being underwater, to bring into light what is hidden under the surface. 
uh, some informative slides, uh, 3D printings that can be used or organizing tours at the place. And there is also a web page where we can, uh, we are uploading the stories of uh, all those that we are studying, so they are accessible from everyone. And training is a major part of this uh, activity because uh, uh, it is what uh, brings people in this uh, domain, uh, either for recreational purposes, there are this is how it started with some distinctive specialties from uh, Paddy. I don't know how many of you are diving and are familiar with the, the dive flag. Okay. You should have this uh, experience at least once since you are uh, all, uh, uh, let's say, interested in the sea. And uh, so there are some uh, training activities for divers. There are also some uh, other activities at our university, the Center of Educational and Lifelong Learning, for uh, training people in the application of underwater surveying techniques. And recently, because of the Science Diver courses, uh, we have produced a new course for scientific diving that we are, it is addressed to, let's say, people working uh, as scientists and uh, doing uh, underwater research. Uh, and diving has to do with accessibility. We can get information, uh, be aware, but uh, if we have the opportunity to dive, this is why we are doing training, uh, we can start education and participation. Now, what are the training challenges? Uh, the educational approaches and the operational needs are um, highly, let's say, interacting in, within an occupational framework. And this, is, this was actually a major part of uh, our work in the Science Diver project to examine those frameworks. And uh, has to do either with formal or non-formal uh, education, uh, the application of standards in this process, and the accreditation, the operational needs, it's something that is changing because the needs of the market are changing, technology is changing, the science, the science itself is changing, and uh, diving also is changing. And the occupational framework is something that we have to face every day with the authorities, with the regulations, with the law, uh, and has to do at the end of the day with the insurance, the safety matters, and the remuneration of the people participating in those activities. Uh, just a few words about our project. It is uh, a European project founded by the European Maritime and uh, Fisheries Fund. Uh, three universities are participating. Uh, Aristotle University as a coordinator, the University of Stuttgart and the University of Calabria. There are also two companies, Envirocom and uh, Atlantis uh, from Germany and Greece. Uh, related to the diving industry, uh, one marine cluster related to the blue sector, and uh, Dan Europe, that is a greater diving organization uh, providing uh, research and uh, insurance for uh, diving, and also supported by CIMAS, uh, the Confederation Mondial de Aquatic, uh, des, uh, des Activités Subaquatiques. The European Underwater Federation, it is responsible for the training matters in diving in Europe and uh, PADI. Um, and the perspectives of this project is uh, to provide, let's say, a base for creating a European directive as a common framework for scientific diving in the European Union. Uh, also develop standards. ISO standards uh, that has to do with uh, the scientific diving competencies. This is a process that uh, is going on and just finished the drafting of, the st of those standards. It was uh, something that uh, happened because of uh, our project and we are very proud about this. And uh, the other thing is to create uh, an advisory board that can operate further beyond the, uh, the end of the project, uh, so can support further either the European Directive or the application of, of standards in uh, national uh, levels. 
And uh, something that uh, resulted from this project is a new Erasmus proposal that has to do with providing uh, scientific diving training at higher education uh, institutes uh, and trying to cover, to provide, uh, let's say, the tools and the uh, way uh, that students can participate in such kinds of trainings for free without having to extra pay because diving is an exp expensive experience and requires uh, money and time. Uh, some conclusions that has to do with the topics of this uh, meeting, uh, just uh, because of uh, related to my presentation. Um, how can we stay competitive in this uh, fast growing? The, our answer is continuing education, and that has to do with adaptation on the needs of the market or the needs of uh, the science. And uh, how can we create attractive? This is something, uh, okay, first thing, we have to apply the scientific, to be able to apply the scientific knowledge on the market. And a way to do this is promote, demonstrate what we are doing. Let people know about uh, the things we are doing underwater. And uh, allow a transition. And uh, concerning the upgrade and the renew, of uh, those uh, uh, and adaptation, it is to allow this alliance between enterprises and education, and that has to do with the evolution of uh, what is going on, either in the education, uh, let's say, sector or the market uh, sector. Um, I please let me know if I have some time, or I am just fine. Okay, nice. I would like to thank you for this. And uh, I just wanted to say, to share with you, that uh, tourism is an experience, okay, you probably, we have all been tourists sometime, uh, that provides an opportunity to get some knowledge from the place we are going. If this is going to be done, let's say, in a way of uh, non-formal training, but uh, to have some uh, um, assistance from professionals, like instructors, for example, or uh, uh, people escorting uh, some tourists, this is a very nice uh, way to take the most out of any touristic experience. Uh, and uh, this is something that we may found uh, and uh, discuss uh, because of this meeting. Uh, I think this is the topic of uh, tomorrow's <laughs> uh, event. Uh, if you would like to uh, visit our site and uh, contact with the project, uh, you can find the details here. And uh, we have some events uh, the next uh, period uh, in order to conclude with this uh, project. Uh, so if you subscribe to the newsletter, you may receive the, this information. And uh, I will be happy to answer any of your questions and uh, see you at one of the next uh, meetings of our project. Thank you. Thank you, Kimon. Thank you. Um, the next project uh, comes from the National Technical University of Athens and is about uh, innovative mentoring tools in the maritime sector and I'd like to welcome Alexandros Ramos who will present it. Thank you, Odysseus, and thank you everyone for being here and giving us the opportunity to present our project, Sea of Experience project, uh, at least a glimpse of that of the three years now that we have, uh, we have started Sea of Experience. I'm a research engineer from the Naval, uh, I'm a Naval architect, the marine engineer, working as a research engineer in the National Technical University of Athens. And uh, we are coordinating this project, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, what is the scope of this project? Well, what we, 
trying to do is to create some innovative tools. Uh, from the presentations I heard before, it is for other industries, for economy, but not for water sports, not for uh, diving. This is, um, this is for mentoring. Mentoring is an activity that brings together a mentor and a mentee. And it's a crucial activity. It's not like training. It's something different. Uh, which is uh, a more personal relation that aims to transfer an experience to a younger, usual person and not knowledge per se. To achieve this, we uh, we have been working. Uh, we are six partners in this consortium. It's with uh, with an individual role uh, to achieve the overall goal. We are working together for 37 months now. We are towards the end of the project and uh, most of the developments uh, have been completed so far. So how do we achieve this? Um, the first thing, the core of the project is the, our platform, the sharing pooling e-platform, well, this is how we call it, uh, which is a common ground to bring together all the developments, all the activities, all the material and the content that we have developed here. Our sectors, as I told you before, is the maritime transport, the cruise industry, port operations, and shipbuilding, shipbuilding ship repair. So um, it's, uh, it's focused on 10 professions, 10 different professions, uh, about two or three professions relevant to each of these domains. Our target groups are not only students and young professionals, but also more senior, let's say, experts. Um, people who have reached the career stage much more uh, advanced, I mean, they are experienced. And uh, they are part of our uh, target groups because they are the people who are going to transfer their experience to the younger generation. And this is a very important thing, uh, especially in Europe in general, but also in the blue careers. Uh, the, thing with, uh, the thing with these industries is that usually, um, uh, usually young students and young people in general uh, are not so familiar with these sectors. Uh, most of us have seen, uh, can or at least can imagine how it is to work in an office or to do a job that most people have seen. But uh, this is not the case uh, where when we are talking about shipping industry, where we are talking about port operations. This is something that it's not so easy to, to experience, to have something to talk about. The ship, is, uh, it's at sea. You cannot find it so easily. To engage this target audience, we have uh, two general types, the general categories of activities. Those are face-to-face -face activities, which include workshops, summer schools, competitions, and uh, others. We will see some of these activities later on. Uh, this, this is something that uh, is uh, very important because we have to have both face-to-face -face events and digital tools. Um, we see those uh, two categories as complementary to each other. Uh, you cannot uh, replace the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction of people, but uh, you can enhance it by using some digital tools uh, at some, at least, um, occasions. So uh, examples for of these uh, digital tools is a gamification app. Uh, it is basically an educational game. Uh, a lot of uh, virtual reality and 360 videos. Uh, we'll see how they fit in the overall concept. And uh, again, digital competitions uh, as a different tool besides the face-to-face -face ones. All the material, everything is uploaded in the platform. Uh, here we can see a glimpse, some screenshots of this platform that we have developed. Uh, the platform features, uh, first of all, a digital repository. Um, this is a digital library with uh, more 
I think now more than 500 uh, selected entries. Uh, it is capable on, of uh, hosting online events uh, and primarily all the content that we have developed and all the content that has been suggested to us because we want this platform to be scalable, not uh, finish with our project, not be completed with the completion of the project. The main thing, as I told you before, is the mentoring activities. And this is the, main f the first functionality of the uh, platform. This, these activities are usually something that um, is conducted face to face. You have to have a personal relationship with the, the mentor, with the mentee, and this is difficult to capture. And uh, this is not only for because of uh, communication issues, but also because um, sometimes we lack reference. What I mean is that, uh, of course, if I am a mentee, I can talk to my mentor even on the, on the phone. I can learn things. Uh, his knowledge, his experiences can be transferred to me. But uh, as you understand, it lacks something. Uh, you cannot have a reference. I cannot talk to somebody, a younger professional, uh, who's a naval architect, who's going to spend his life in, in a ship, and uh, talk to him without something to show, something to refer to, something to make him understand. And if he's young, he probably has never uh, get on board a ship. And this is also from my experience. We, I am a naval engineer, and uh, I, I was around 22, 23 the first time I get on board a ship. Uh, so far, we have conducted uh, more than 10 mentoring sessions. Uh, these are structured sessions. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, from the platform itself. Here we can see a screenshot from the first pilot uh, session we did. Uh, we cannot share more information because, as I said, it's confidential. And it, uh, it's a personal relationship. We cannot show many things about this. Uh, but uh, these are ongoing. We have a pool of uh, 28 mentors now. Uh, those are people who voluntarily uh, offered to, to get in this uh, activity because they have, they have also something to gain. The younger ones can get uh, knowledge from <coughs> from most senior, but uh, when somebody gets into the place of uh, teaching something or transferring something, he has a lot to gain himself. And this is uh, crucial feedback that we have captured from the sessions we have done so far. Uh, one of the face-to-face -face activities, as I said before, is the become an expert for a day, as we call it. This activity is um, essentially that we bring someone to um, the place, uh, the working environment, the real working environment, following an expert in his day of work for one day, asking him questions uh, and everything he wants. Not only technical things, but things that are important uh, for his career. Uh, this is a relationship based on trust. So you follow an expert and you can learn a lot of things from this. Uh, so here we have a video. I'm not sure if this is going to play. And uh, I want to warn that it's quite loud. This is something that um, we want to capture. We want somebody who, uh, who virtually visits a space to experience the true hardships of this. Uh, in an engine room, the sound is I mean, you cannot uh, stay there for longer than 30 minutes. So, uh, I will try, let's see if... Uh so, this is from uh, one of our visits. I tried not to capture uh, the, the engineer who was talking to us. Uh, I visited together with the mentee here. Um, this is due to 
uh, consent issues, not anything more. Um, so moving on, what, uh, and here comes the part, what the platform does, what the platform offers. This is an activity that can be done a limited amount of times. I mean, how many times can you engage a professional to go to his place of work and um, take some effort, take some time of his day to show some things. So we try to digitalize this to the extent possible, of course. Uh, this is done mostly by creating 360 videos. These are, uh, of course, I cannot capture a 360 video in a screenshot, but uh, you can navigate freely on this environment. You can see everything. You can uh, get transferred, teleported, let's say, uh, to different areas. And each of these, uh, each of these areas that we have captured, uh, this is for uh, nine, for this for nine professions relevant to the domains I mentioned earlier, and it, it has some added um, pop-ups, as we call it. It's uh, an added information. For example, for the welder, we say down there, um, if uh, somebody is interested in uh, looking into w what is what is that? What is something in this area? Uh, he can click it. Uh, we have uh, linked it with uh, educational videos, uh, material, paper, articles. Uh, I mean, uh, everything is on the table. Everything that ca may be valuable. Um, and this is a tool that digitalizes also the mentoring activity. When uh, you can have um, a remote, a virtual, a teleconference, uh, you can have this from Skype, from Teams, from whatever, but uh, you want to have a reference. And this reference is offered by this environment. So if I am a mentor, I can now not only talk about something and describe it and uh, Google it and show some pictures, but I have something structured, uh, like a common ground, to show whatever I want. To develop this, we were in close, very close collaboration with professionals because um, they know what is important uh, in an area. They know what is needed for a young person to learn. So uh, they help us a lot to structure this. Uh, as a step beyond that, we are trying to make this in uh, virtual reality. This is uh, developed in Unreal, Unreal Engine, and is a 3D representation of um, of a ship engine room, a bulk carrier for, to be exact. And this is even more difficult to show in uh, some pictures. Uh, you have to experience with the right goggles, with the, the whites uh, on the side. Uh, and what this does is, um, let's say that a mentor or a mentee wants to show something, wants to virtually be inside an engine room. This is an opportunity that there is n nobody, nobody has this opportunity. You have to wait for the ship. And this is also something that uh, shipping companies, for example, told us that uh, is very, very interesting for them, for uh, training, for the familiarization of their uh, crews uh, when they are waiting for the ship. They are prepared. This is an added value for everyone not just for tra transferring the knowledge and the experience. Moving on, uh, we have conducted some competitions. Uh, those are both face-to-face -face and digital, again. Uh, of course, due to the COVID limitations at the beginning of the project, we had some problems with the face-to-face, -face, so we had to make some of them digital, again. Uh, but uh, the good thing in this was that we have uh, quite good participation and very, very good feedback. I mean that uh, all the participants uh, got in contact with something they didn't, they hadn't seen before. Uh, I'll just give you an example uh, for one competition and how a competition can attract people in the blue careers. Uh, let's take an example of a chef, a student chef. Uh, a student chef, usually when he is 20, 22 years old, he has on his mind that he is going to work on a restaurant, which means something. Uh, 
the everyday life, on what he's doing uh, for the financial benefits, uh, whatever they have. So in a competition that we take these chefs and we ask them to create, to develop a very structured, uh, based on several criteria, a menu for a ship, a for a cruise vessel, which is uh, very, very demanding, I mean, there are eight, 9,000 people on board, uh, and consider waste management, then the chef comes into contact with something that he or she wouldn't have seen otherwise. And uh, the feedback, again, from these people uh, is that uh, they actually wanted to pursue a career on this. This is what I believe is the behavior change. This is what attracts people in these careers. And uh, I mean, cruise ships need uh, a lot of crew. Um, so we have conducted so far two digital competitions and uh, two face-to-face -face competitions, uh, one in Greece and one in Cyprus. Of course, they the digital competitions were international. Uh, Excuse me. And um, we have several topics, uh, not only for the cooks, but also for engineers, uh, for design, for something that they have both, they need both to learn something and then apply it and see how, how it goes, how, what feedback we give them. Uh, then we have the summer schools. Uh, we have conducted again uh, four summer schools. Um, I'm very happy to say that, uh, especially in the summer school, the feedback was great. Uh, the participants had the opportunity to see something that they, they hadn't seen before, uh, be it uh, some soft skills, be it uh, presentations, I mean, and training on soft skills, on communication, leadership, things that are not typically in uh, education curricula of uh, university, but uh, in my opinion, uh, maybe even more important than the technical skills, at least in some cases. Uh, here we see a glimpse on the left from our visit to Athena Training Center. Uh, it's a training center from a large shipping company, Minerva Maritime. And the students had the opportunity to see one of the best, if not the best, uh, simulator in Europe and that basically means global, globally. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's the, uh, the high end, let's say. And uh, this is something that only a handful of people have been trained on. And this is uh, also something that the companies uh, really uh, enjoyed. Uh, and not really enjoyed because we we're having fun, but enjoyed because they engaged some students, they showcased why their company is uh, cutting edge, why, what exists in the market, because you cannot have anything in the market. You, you have some shipping companies and other shipping companies that are more advanced or less advanced in the educational uh, technologies, let's call it. Uh, from all of these activities, our main purpose is to collect feedback, feedback to, to enhance these results, to enhance our solutions, to see what else is needed. And um, I might say that uh, three years before, uh, the concept was not exactly the same as it is now because it has been readapted to what the actual needs are. Uh, for example, the CP company really liked the idea of the mentoring uh, platform to familiarize the new crew with, the, um, with their ships. Uh, and uh, I think we are closing in at the end. This is uh, a glimpse of our gamification application. This is a video game app, uh, but an educational one. Uh, here, uh, an engineering officer uh, has to um, has to learn a procedure in the training mode. Uh, the procedure we chose is the fuel changeover, which is uh, uh, 
let's call it a trending topic now because of uh, the environmental regulations and the environmental concerns of burning fossil fuels, especially close to the shore. And uh, this is something al that all engineering officers should learn about. So there is a training mode where the um, learner can uh, uh, see more information, navigate freely, and there there is a scenario mode which uh, crisis, let's call it, occurs, and you have to do this, uh, uh, this procedure fast and correct. You are evaluated at both points. Uh, this uh, gamification application found ground on another target group, the School of uh, Naval Officers in Aspropyrgos, here in Athens, in Greece. Um, we received very, very much uh, feedback from them, very positive feedback and some, uh, some uh, items that we addressed to, um, to be realistic, to adapt to what the end user needs in other words. So to close up, um, here we have some uh, numbers from Sea Experience. Uh, for the four competitions, we have a total of about 180 participants so far. We have one more competition, which will be in December. Uh, the four summer school, uh, schools excuse me, had more than 100 participants. Uh, we have conducted more than 30 visits now, but as you understand, the visits it's not easy to have more visits uh, on in place. Uh, we have developed the 10 videos, one uh, virtual reality and nine 360, as I said before, and uh, having now 30 mentors and uh, 11 sessions uh, done, uh, this may be 12, and some more ongoing. Uh, we are very happy to say that uh, the platform now works as expected and uh, we now have resolved uh, pretty much all the comments and all incorporated all the feedback that we have received and of course is within the scope of CF experience. Um, so I think uh, Eric and I don't want to take more of your time and thank you very much. I will be very happy for any questions, for anything you may need. Thank you, Alexandros. Uh, we have a coffee, but one more presentation to go before that. And I'd like to call uh, Yanis Sotirakos. Um, Yanis um, will show us a way to turn the, a rag boat into a small oceanographic station. And this uh, with no funding yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Καλημέρα και από μένα. Ναι, όπω είπε ο Οδυσσέα, νομίζω ότι δυστυχώ εγώ σα χωρίζω τώρα από τον καφέ. Οπότε θα προσπαθήσω να το κάνω να, να αξίζει. Ε, και όπω επίση σωστά είπε, and I will turn in English, so this is a project that is totally privately funded, practically by me until, until now, because I deeply believe in that and I would like to share with you what, what it is. So, it's called Explore Blue. Uh, you know, we obviously know we live in a blue uh, planet and uh, the sea is the most unexplored uh, part of uh, this uh, planet, as many of you p already, p already know. Uh, and um, it's also a fact that uh, billions of people uh, somehow interact with the sea every day by going to p p resorts uh, which are by the sea, by going uh, p embarking on uh, ships, uh, in beaches, in, uh, different, in many different uh, ways. So what if we could crowdsource, what if we could uh, make uh, some use of this uh, dormant capacity of all these millions and billions of people going to the sea and interacting with the sea every day? Explore Blue is an effort exactly about, uh, about that. Uh, it's uh, an effort, a platform, and I will explain exactly what this platform is, uh, where p with the aim to transform any beach location, any uh, resort which is by the sea, any activity or water sport uh, station, and any boat, 
to transform it into an oceanographic uh, p station uh, p through citizen science and through also at the same time providing new experiences to the people who are interacting with, uh, with the sea. How p we do that? I, we do that with uh, four p main p tools. Uh, we are developing what we call the Explore Blue Tech Packs, uh, which I will show what it is. Uh, the P Explore Blue missions, which is a range of experiences uh, P that can be conducted either from P anywhere P by the sea, a beach P or P a resort or a marina or whatever, or P in, in a boat. And uh, a platform, which we call the Explore Blue Digital uh, Hub, where all this comes, P comes together. Uh, the, I don't know why the p format is not, uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> the p Explore Blue Tech uh, Packs, uh, it's uh, practically we have developed uh, until now uh, uh, or integrated uh, five different packs. The Explore Blue Sensor Pack, it is uh, a, a custom made uh, sensor uh, with five uh, sensors and the hydrophone. Uh, the ROV pack, it's about uh, a, a, an ROV, an underwater p vehicle. Uh, this is not manufactured by us or developed by us, but we have a commercial collaboration with uh, the, the manufacturer. Um, it is uh, the Explore Blue Mission Control Pack, which integrates all this uh, together and some other uh, equipment uh, around, uh, around this. Uh, this is how it looks. We have already uh, developed them, we have already tested them, and uh, <coughs> uh, we have uh, uh, developed uh, the uh, sensor pack and the uh, mission control uh, pack. Uh, what you see here are some screenshots of the uh, mission control uh, pack, which integrates practically all the different uh, uh, technology uh, equipment, the sensors, the ROV, etc., in order to provide uh, an experience for everybody, either uh, on, on a boat or uh, on, the, on the shore. Uh, we are developing also a number of uh, different experiences uh, that uh, are associated and are leveraging uh, these uh, technology p uh, elements. And uh, a digital hub, this is under development, it's not yet uh, developed, where the idea is uh, to, to bring together and everybody, as we say, can become a blue explorer. So every client of uh, an activity center, every client of uh, a boat, uh, a charter boat or a private uh, boat. Uh, can uh, practically uh, register and uh, see and uh, collect uh, points as uh, it uh, visits, uh, as he or she visits uh, different locations uh, around the uh, around Greece or in, uh, around the uh, the world that are associated with um, with that. And uh, finally, a, a network of uh, a partners like uh, universities, uh, marine research uh, organizations. Uh, we have done some discussions with El Cefe until now, uh, University of uh, Aegean and uh, some others, um, who are uh, provided a backdoor entrance in this platform, uh, having access to all this data, content, information uh, about uh, what the people are crowdsourcing uh, through this uh, through this platform to um, use this for the uh, for their research uh, purposes which have to do with the well-being of the of the sea so what uh, who can uh, benefit uh, for uh, of that of this uh, platform a uh, private boats chartered boats uh, fishing and cruise ships hotels and resorts marinas uh, beachfront uh, locations and uh, marine parks. Uh, these are some of the impact uh, examples which have to do uh, through using all these uh, uh, sensors and activity and the content uh, 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 generation uh, 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 items. Uh, uh, together with uh, the sheer capacity of uh, the people, you know, doing, for example, a cleaning p p missions f on the beaches or on the uh, p depth of the, p on, the p on the bottom of the sea. 
the second, uh, so this is uh, an overview of what this uh, pla the Explore Blue platform uh, is. More specifically, uh, we are interested on how to apply this on uh, on boats. Uh, and uh, one key issue with uh, the marine, uh, the, the boating industry right now, is uh, uh, the sustainability uh, issue. So what uh, we are trying to do is to transform uh, boats into small oceanographic uh, vessels. Uh, by this way, we are trying to productize uh, sustainability uh, by performing for these uh, boats in their activity time, uh, whatever they are, if private or chartered uh, boats, to contribute towards the sustainability of, um, of the sea. Uh, we have uh, collaborated with uh, Rafnar. Rafnar is a, p a manufacturer, a boat manufacturer, a boat builder uh, from Iceland, where the shipyards are here in uh, Greece. So we have collaborated with uh, Rafnar to create the first Explore Blue p uh, boat. Uh, this is p uh, it this is delivered uh, August, this August, just uh, a few months, uh, uh, a few months ago. Uh, it's a 12-meter uh, inflatable uh, boat equipped with uh, all these uh, packs and uh, capabilities that uh, you see there. We intend to use it as a pilot uh, and as a proof of concept uh, to demonstrate how uh, these boats, uh, this type of boats can um, uh, actually really productize sustainability for the boating uh, uh, industry. Uh, we have already done some uh, p pilot uh, tests and experiences uh, with, uh, with people and it really went uh, very, very well. Uh, it took us practically two years of uh, development. Uh, it started with, uh, p in January 2021 and the boat uh, was delivered, uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, just uh, two, months, uh, two months ago. And uh, we believe that uh, this creates also a new category of boats, not only for uh, Rafnar, which is the first uh, example, but for other uh, potential um, uh, boat builders uh, as well. And uh, finally, boats are uh, the, the uh, one very key, very important uh, tool to implement uh, this, but the other also equally important tool is what we call the Explore Blue Spots. Uh, Explore Blue Spots, it's uh, any location uh, by the sea. It can be a marina, it can be a beach, it can be a resort or a hotel, a port, uh, whatever. And um, we are developing them uh, there based on the Explore Blue uh, idea and platform and equipment. Uh, we are developing either small scale location. Imagine, for example, uh, you have a water sport uh, activity and you are enhancing it uh, with uh, this type of activities uh, uh, as well. Being able to do uh, measurements, uh, content uh, development, uh, uh, having drones who um, t mon are monitoring the, uh, the sea uh, environment combined, uh, combined maybe with uh, diving or other type of uh, activities. So it can be small scale, housed in a container or in whatever structure uh, uh, that, can, uh, that is uh, suitable by the sea, uh, or bigger, uh, bigger scale as um, uh, hubs for the, blue, uh, for the blue economy, hosted in a uh, resort or in some bigger uh, location. Uh, we have been uh, p uh, we have presented and uh, launched uh, practically this uh, only last uh, month in an event that we did in uh, the Hellenicon Experience uh, Park. Uh, we are p discussing with them about uh, the Explore Blue project and about a very similar project that we are developing, uh, which uh, which is somehow the equivalent uh, for the for the land. The Explore Blue is for the sea, so. It's it's uh, the equivalent for the land, which we call the cell of life. So we presented both these um, projects uh, in Elinicon. The cell of life is this uh, dome that uh, you see over there. 
uh, and uh, we are p more than happy p to uh, p collaborate, to work together, and to p partner p also for p you know future uh, European or p national p programs uh, towards uh, p the blue economy activities based on uh, based on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, we have a 20 minute break now. Please feel free. Uh, it is also funded by the same Blue Career initiative that uh, ours has uh, been funded. And uh, Orze was, uh, will, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Orze, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm pronouncing your name right. So maybe you can start with your name. <laughs> okay. So, uh, thank you. Uh, my name my is Hervoy Aratkayat uh, from, from Slovenia, from, from the company, company Arthur. Arthur. Shall I go on? Yes, please. OK. okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for inviting me uh, to your event, to your conference. Unfortunately, I can't go to you uh, physical in person. Uh, but still, I hope you will find the presentation from the project that I will present an interesting thing. It's about tourism. It's about challenges of using data in tourism. So a little bit about our company. Uh, we are basically an IT company uh, with more than 30 years of experience um, engaged in various industry 4.0 technologies uh, like high performance computing, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and so forth. And our idea uh, was basically to use the technologies and try to implement them in the field of tourism to make tourism more digital and sustainable but uh, with a key point that it always uh, is focused on the local inhabitant and improves the quality of life of the local inhabitant of the local community so this is our core value of tourism uh, 4.0 as we call it of our ecosystem uh, the you can see here different projects where we are engaged in uh, and uh, on different TRL scale. And I will present now more concretely about Tourism 4.0 from the, uh, for the Black Sea project, uh, which was about combination of tourism and data analytics founded by uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Funds duration uh, from 2019 until 2021 with partners from Georgia, uh, Romania, Ukraine, and Greece. What were the general objectives and aims of the project? Uh, they were about commercialization of high performance data analytics, or meaning of how to analyze big data and how to use those analysis to, uh, in tourism to make it more like I said, digital and also sustainable. And to see if there are potentials for this kind of services of big data analytics in the Black Sea region. The core activities in the project follow from this. Uh, first, it was about testing, development and testing of tourism impact model and pilot destinations. And in parallel, also acquiring data from different levels and see uh, what the results we get from analyzing those big data. Uh, third step was demonstration of um, the results from TIM and big data analytics to regional stakeholders and validation of any outputs that we uh, that came out of it. As well as making, uh, setting up uh, basic uh, says basing stones for further capitalization and commercialization of these kind of tools in the region. So what is tourism impact model? Tourism impact model is a tool which uses real data, qualitative and quantitative, with the aim to create an objective picture of the impact of tourism at a certain micro location. In using the data, it also acts as a digital twin of the tourism destination and allows for more 
data-driven strategic planning in tourism with the aim of more sustainable tourism. Uh, we won an award at Tourism Innovation Summit for, uh, for Tourism Impact Model for Tim Short uh, two years ago. And uh, Tim has so far been successfully uh, tested and implemented beside the Black Sea region, also in the Danube region and in Slovenia with more than 40 locations. So how does team works? Basically, it starts with the selection of the most appropriate geographical micro-location. That can be a municipality, that can be a city, that can be a destination, which is a region or a combination uh, of several municipalities together. It all depends on how do we want to assess. Then we map the data sources. Based on the mapping of data sources, we input all the data into the data collecting tool in the form of a questionnaire, and we launch the automated assessment tool. Automated assessment tool basically provides an automatic report with the results of the assessment. In practice, uh, we have more than 300 different indicators with which we measure the impact of tourism grouped in several groups here you can see the main groups environment economy society and culture and collaboration so environment economy society and culture are basically the groups that are also very important for the carrying capacity of tourism and we had collaboration meaning collaboration between different stakeholders in tourism and there are questions which uh, where we want to collect uh, qualitative data and also quantitative data, quantitative data. And all this come together in a report with uh, visual and also written results. In addition, uh, for in parallel to collecting uh, the data, we also want to measure the accuracy of the data. So it's not only about is the data inputted, but it's also how the data is accurate. And do we get really the, the, the accurate picture of the impact of tourism? And for this, we also use a uh, um, data accuracy report, which is like a supplement to the main team report that the customer gets. The main result uh, that the customer can see where, where it can orientate itself uh, regarding the impact of tourism is so-called the destination character chart, uh, which here four quadrants. And on the uh, y-axis, the benefits, we basically provide the customer with the results, what are the good good stuff that comes from tourism. Uh, are there higher salaries for tourism workers? More income? Um, are the, the objects of, for example, culture and natural heritage digitalized, and, et cetera, et cetera. And on the x-axis, we provide them results regarding the negative impacts of tourism, meaning, uh, for example, consumption of natural resources, where there, this, where is, there is a scarcity of, the, of those resources, like water, or electricity, or overcrowdedness of the destination, etc. And um, by doing the assessment multiple times, the destination can always see how it's progressing, or in some cases degressing, um, on on this chart, uh, and what should it do to to achieve a better result. We used the team prototype and tested it at six pilot tourism destinations in the Tourism 4.0 for the Black Sea project, um, two in Romania, two in Ukraine, and two in Georgia. Uh, and those destinations were quite different, which was good. So some were like smaller villages, but we also had big cities and also one region. First, in the project, we developed the team prototype for the Black Sea, and then we demonstrated it with local stakeholders, with project partners, but with also other tourism stakeholders to get their feedback, improve it, and see, um, 
and uh, uh, verify the final results, which for the region are one of the challenges. The challenges are in the data because quite a lot of data is not available and it generally it's quite, the accuracy is quite low. And this means that the results that come out from TIM uh, are not really the uh, representative for the tourism uh, for the particular locations that we tested it because we don't have enough accurate data. Um, what we can provide uh, as a glimpse so far is that all those locations um, are dominant, have smaller benefits but also smaller negative impacts of tourism and not surprisingly that some big destinations, big cities show more negative impacts of tourism, particularly uh, regarding some uh, consumption of natural resources. Uh, in these uh, charts you can see the comparison between Batumi in Georgia and Odessa in Ukraine. Um, and like I said, for Odessa it was really also a challenge with uh, quite a lot of missing uh, data. The second challenge uh, and activity in the project was about big data analytics. So this is a little bit different uh, because here we operate with quite a lot of uh, data uh, on different levels, on local data, open data, satellite data, big platform providers uh, which are international corporations and so forth. And I will present to you some of the results they came out. Uh, I will focus on two uh, locations particularly, on Odessa and Batumi. For Odessa, you can see here we have different uh, data regarding hospitality, um, but we also have like data, uh, local data for the weather, and we also have data on uh, for mobile, uh, opera from mobile operators. And for Batumi, uh, we also started with the hospitality data, but we combined with spending data, with weather data, and also with satellite data regarding air quality and the construction. So a glimpse into what we can see and what we can learn from using big data analytics in the case of Odessa. You, you can see here um, one example uh, from where the tourists come from, uh, what are their um, what are their uh, type, uh, what are their type? For example, are they groups? Are they families? Are they couple? Uh, what is the rating of different uh, different um, attractions and hotels? Uh, you can see their movement through the years, etc., and from the, where they come from using fly data. Uh, so this is like a um, snapshot into tourism, in tourist profile, in, in tourist behavior. And with the mobile data, we can go even more accurate and observe how, on which locations are tourists moving and uh, on which parts of the day and on which hour also. So uh, this is also I mean, very accurate, um, very good to observe the behavior of tourists in the city of Odessa. For Batumi, uh, a similar story, where they come from, uh, what type of they are, but also we can observe uh, what um, the tourists from different countries, what they spend on, at which part of the year do they travel most often? This is like a summer season and we wanted to see if there are any correlations for example with if they come in particular uh, warmer days, do they spend more or do they spend differently than on colder days and so forth. And you can then play a little bit around with this. Uh, with satellite data, we also wanted to add another data source and see uh, if there is any correlation between, for example, um, air quality, meaning uh, pollutant gases, pollutant hard particles in the air, and, um, and the number of tourists at the destination, at the Batumi, 
And if there is uh, anything uh, regarding construction and land movement, uh, for example, endangering uh, tourist sites and tourist attractions. So here is like a snippet into the comparison between Odessa and Batumi uh, using the big data. And key results that came out of the project are, as mentioned, for the tourism impact model, um, they're about data availability and data reliability. So difficulties to obtain the data and poor accuracy of the data that were, it was possible to obtain. For big data analytics, despite, uh, I mean, in addition to those additional uh, nice graphs, uh, still it's quite uh, a challenge to get the data from the data sources. Uh, they prove to be too aggregated, meaning too general, uh, to offer any source, any to offer a strong source of analysis at the destination level, and especially if you want to use it on a daily basis, because we were able to get historical data, but get the data in a continuous flow and use it and make any time predictions. This was um, this would be another completely new challenge. Uh, following the both two points, uh, also the local stakeholders are really not experienced. Uh, and know uh, little about how to use data to manage tourism, which in the end weakens sectoral policies in the region. And the next steps, and we proposed um, with, uh, together with our project partners and with regional stakeholders is um, support a more effective digitalization of tourism, more systematic collection of data and more a holistic management of the reason. So all those lessons learned, we transformed them into these key follow-up actions, uh, which are basically summed up in our tourism fund uh, for BS, meaning tourism fund 4.0 for the Black Sea Declaration, supporting a stronger digital and sustainable tourism across the Black Sea. And I invite you to check the declaration to check the website of the project and sign it if you find it interesting and I'm of course available for any uh, for any questions or comments. Thank you. And, uh, you can send the questions through the Teams channel or through the Eventbrite channel for uh, participants that uh, are present here and now I would like to invite uh, Petros Adamandidis or Nikos Ververidis, I don't know who will present, for another project underwater. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. It's nice to be here with uh, so many friends. Um, I would like to, uh, Petros and I were developing together and we're the, the producers of a project called uh, G and dive. Actually, it is about the opportunities of diving in Greece uh, in uh, uh, in our beautiful waters. A uh, few words of us, and Petrus will tell you more about the project. Is uh, that we're a production company, developers uh, that we make. We're a production house. Uh, that doesn't matter, and you, you'll see. That is uh, specialized in creating content. Um, mostly we are specialized in creating documentaries, uh, films, digital assets, social initiatives, etc. Uh, LC Production has. Okay. LC Productions is uh, also specialized in uh, creating cultural content, so we're trying to uh, take the benefit of these two worlds and uh, to describe a project, to develop a project, uh, a unique project that uh, uh, we believe is going to interest uh, the people we are going to attend to. Um, Petros, maybe, uh, also if I must say more about us, uh, we have uh, just a minute. So, 
more, more or less is what I said before. And here are just a few references and cooperations and project we developed um, with that's the previous one, if it's possible. Uh, with uh, the previous one. Anyway, it doesn't. Ah, here, as you may see, the, uh, you can see numbers of uh, n numbers of, uh, pro of organizations that uh, we have uh, produced content, uh, which means that uh, we have really a big footprint, uh, social footprint, and. Um, here are some of our productions, um, cultural productions, like the Opera and uh, the National Gallery, uh, or Kazatzakis, uh, or historical projects, uh, one we developed uh, with the USA Embassy, or social projects like Epikindiness or uh, the Game Changers. And uh, now it's time to, uh, just to say a few words for the ones that we are going to be in Thessaloniki. On uh, Saturday, on Sunday, sorry, is going to be uh, the screening of this documentary, which actually talks about our, our city and uh, how basketball was born in, in this city. Um, yes, this is a national uh, co-production with NBA and promote the culture of Thessaloniki in the huge audience, the international audience of NBA. Uh, Sunday is the, the premier day in Thessaloniki. Okay, so let's go to our project, Aegean Dive. As the Minister of Culture, Lina Medoni, stated that uh, we have a lot of wealth underwater. It's not only the archaeological sites that we discuss and the heritage, but also several uh, World War II secrets that create a strong development uh, opportunity for special target group of the diving community. And in this project, we concentrated to create storytelling tools in order to position, uh, in order to position Greece as an international diving destination. We have two major developments the last years. The first is the opening of the underwater museum in Alonsos that create a great international exposure. And we face it in different festivals that we go on abroad and also in online media. And the second development is that last year, uh, Minister of Culture released more than 90 shipwrecks to be open for guide and organized tours for the diving community. And I don't think that they do a lot of things about the promotion of the, uh, the and position in Greece as a destination. We have to start, we have to take the opportunity and create all the tools, communication tools, content, like Kimon said before, uh, storytelling documentaries that uh, towards this uh, aim. So, our project name is Aegean Dive. Aegean because it's the greatest the, the world with the greatest awareness, even in Europe, the States, in, or even in the Asia. And it's a holistic approach. Uh, it's a docu-series, a TV program, and a digital assets that can support all the programs, all the partners, from professionals <coughs> by professionals that have more than 20 years of experience in different uh, areas, <laughs> culture, filming, diving. We have a good partnership with Costa Stoktaridis that has all the technical equipment and the experience to move on in the Aegean. And in each episode, we, drive, we travel in a different dive uh, destination. So, just a moment. We have some problem with the PowerPoint. Again. So, the four main points of the project is to focus the Aegean iconic and famous destination because we have famous island, but, uh, but we're going to uncover or discover uh, the sea ecosystem. We select 12 ships uh, that are approachable. They're not in very deep uh, uh, level in the sea. It's about 10 to 30 or 40 meters. So it's approachable for a wide range of the divers. Uh, in addition, we promote the sea ecosystem because we have safe seas. We have clean waters and also we promote the authentic island culture, which is we're going to discover not the famous part of Rhodes, Casos, or Kalimnos, but the uncover and the local culture. Uh, in each episode, we travel, we explore a new destination. We visit different uh, Aegean islands, and we're going to see. And we're going to dive to the most amazing sea world. We have special shots from uh, underwater, but also we're going to meet authentic characters 
and local stories under the concept Live Like a Local in order to create a, a holistic approach. So we have to create a program that is uh, part of activities and venture, is travel, and also it has also uh, a personal human story touch. Uh, some destinations will move from Bogotá to Sunio. We are going to see the, um, uh, the map of Greece. We start with, just a moment, we start with Casos, then we move to Rhodes, Kalimnos, Leros, and then we move to Chiclades. Uh, all the, the island have uh, some famous shipwrecks, uh, in Kea, in Syros, and the last uh, station will be Sunion and Labrio that has a lot of uh, potential. You're going to see, we have our research with Mr. Tokdaridis and uh, has found a lot of uh, shipwrecks and some planes, which is very famous for the divers, especially for the World War II community. And then we move to Chiclades, Tithnos, Labrio, in Egino we have the Hydra, uh, and also in Labrio we have some special, like the plane of the World War II. Macronos, and, and the final episode will be in Sunio because it's combined also Attica region and combines also the archaeological sites and the uh, Athens Riviera. So, if we move to see the whole project ID, the first of all is to create a documentary series, which is going not only in national uh, TV station, but also to create a partnership in order to have cooperation and co-production with international uh, streaming channels, because this is the aim of the project. Uh, the second thing is that we create a library content for uh, our own media, for website, for our partners, for all the ecosystem. The third is the production of educational and promotional content for publicity, and educational, of course, for schools and other professionals. And all this uh, supported uh, content also from El Culture resources. We have journalists, we have writers in order to create all this supported content in other media. Uh, maybe there are some programs of our community, maybe some case studies and all these things. We we'll create, as we say, a multi-channel production for all the media. And of course, support all visual presentation, programs, activation, exhibition, and events. Uh, I think that the, uh, from this production is not only the TV and the streaming platform, but the whole partners ecosystem they are going to take advantage. Uh, as for direction, cinematic approach, we have a contrast. For the, from the one side, we have the amazing uh, deep blue uh, shootings and the amazing Greek island uh, withdrawn. And from the other hand, the very close approach to the people, uh, their culture, dining, gastronomy, agro, and all the sustainable ecosystem of the islands. Uh, as for the co-production, for co-production credits, we partner with uh, Dive Planet Blue, Costa Stoktaridis team, is an expert, has uh, all the technical equipment. Uh, more than 30 years he's diving in all the shipwrecks, and he also cooperates with National Geographic and BBC for all the documentaries. So we are going to have uh, amazing shots uh, in the Aegean. Uh, we bring to the team a Greek-American film filmmaker that produces adventure, uh, specialized in sustainable forms of tourism. He starts with the mountains and the snow. He creates uh, the frozen ambrosia for olibos of the crater rising. And now he's moving to the sea in order to create an international production level uh, uh, project that are going to touch not only the national, but also the international audiences. Constantinos is very exciting about this. Uh, we have meetings uh, together. He, came in, he is coming to Greece next month in order to start developing the creative part of the project. Thank you very much. This is the message. Of we are going to discuss with a lot of partners here because we have a lot of synergies together. Uh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Petros. Very, very exciting, all, all this that uh, you're presenting. We have one more presentation. The final project comes from the cruise sector. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ioannis Papas. This is a, a double act. We have uh, the coordinator, uh, Marika Mazi Boem from uh, Italy. 
presenting the program with uh, Yanis Papas. Thank you. So Marika is here. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Yes, yes I'm connected. connected. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, thank you, Odysseus, for the invitation. I'm Ioannis Papas. I'm representing uh, the consortium of a uh, already started new program that is related with eco-cruising, with uh, sustainability actually in cruising sector, which is above the sea. We have seen a lot of things uh, below the sea. So uh, this is uh, our project. We started uh, two months ago. So it's a very, very uh, young project. And actually, today we are going to make a very short presentation about uh, uh, this uh, new project. The interesting thing, I, I don't know about the presentation. Uh, the idea was Marika, no. which is the coordinator of the consortium uh, from X23 company from Italy, is going to make the presentation. So, yes. OK, no problem. So, uh, so the idea behind is that we're trying to elaborate, uh, let's say, the knowledge that is already in place in many countries focusing on West Med area. So we're talking about how, uh, let's say, the cruise industry can uh, transform, actually, in one other way, in a more uh, sustainable, let's say, model. And um, mainly, let's say, to, to go further in, in the creation of new smart and resilient products that is going to be the proposal for the for the industry, which is more or less related with what you are doing in one sense. However, it is more connected with digital tools and uh, smartness. All right, so um, it's very small <laughs> over there. So in reality, this is what we are doing. I mean, uh, we have uh, partners for uh, many countries in the area of Mediterranean basin. So starting from the coordinator, which is X23, uh, then we go actually to Italy also, which is the ENIT, which is, uh, let's say, one of the biggest, uh, let's say, public uh, authorities related with tourism in, in, in Italy. Then we're going to Greece. Uh, we are Green Evolution, a company that's related with sustainable tourism. Then we go to Cyprus. From, uh, from Cyprus, we have uh, the center about uh, uh, marine and uh, more other uh, actually uh, works that are related with, uh, uh, with marine and coastal activity. We come back to uh, actually Greece because I, I forgot Celestian, which is uh, one of the important, let's actually um, uh, providers of uh, cruise uh, services as you know, and then we go to Spain, which is ASHAM, which is a company that's related with uh, dissemination of the program. And when we go to uh, north part of uh, Africa, we're talking about three countries. So uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. So all this combination is related with the scope of our work, which we're trying to make this cross-border collaboration about this issue. So we're talking about how the whole area is connected and discussing about new proposals and digital actually solutions in order to make this transition, which is a very big issue. Right now, in, uh, not only in Europe, but in a global level, there is a big discussion how it, is, it could be connected, actually, this proposal of tourism, like starting from cruise, going to ports, going to destinations. So all this part of the chain, how it could be connected. All right, and this project is started, like I said, two months ago. The duration is 28 months, and we hope we're going to have a very smooth and very productive, actually, um, actually collaboration. So you have discussed, you have actually proposed and presented a lot of very interesting inf uh, projects and information behind. Uh, you know that in our case, for our project, the big problem is that, as you can see, it's a matter of size, it's a matter of uh, actually um, how sustainability and all the things that coming from climate change related and uh, the targeting about going to a more net zero model of operation can be implemented, and especially in countries that we would like to have more 
connected with this actually model like in the North, uh, in the North Africa. So how we can do that? Uh, we are trying to, let's say, to elaborate and create a very big uh, actually pool of information and good practice around this area of the world. Uh, Marika is going to discuss more about that. However, innovation is a critical point of that discussion and how uh, all these um, new technologies and digitalizing many things in, uh, let's say, the product pro uh, proposal can be implemented. Uh, and this, of course, should be made, and this is a very critical point in this kind of uh, projects, with straight connection with uh, actually the market itself. So we're going to have a very close connection in this market with the SMEs that are related or creating part of, uh, let's say, this innovation or content or new technology products in order to engage them in this uh, transformation. Uh, maybe, uh, Marika, you can go uh, to the next slide. Okay, of course, as you can imagine, everything goes through awareness, training, and education. So we're talking a lot, like I have seen in another project, especially in the Naftilus project, about creating awareness, creating training in different kinds of skills, because all these people is not very, let's say, per se, definitely, uh, let's say, related with the knowledge behind, we don't know actually really, and this is what we are doing now in the first uh, months of this project, we are uh, estimating what is the base of the knowledge of these people. I mean, what exactly they know about this, about sustainability, innovation, technology, digitalizing, uh, smartness, and all this kind of stuff, in order to, to go afterwards, uh, next slide, please, and go to a specific focus in specific, actually, uh, market, uh, let's say, segment, in order to create what we are discussing about. So. Of course, we're taking into account what happens in the, next, in the last two years because it was a very uh, destructive, or let's say, um, uh, how I call it, uh, uh, a very new, at least, period for not only for crews about COVID, but also for tourism, of, of, of course. So we're trying to evaluate also not the general, uh, let's say, uh, solution of uh, the progress on that direction that we said about innovation and digitalizing, but also what was really the impact of COVID in this market, in this area of uh, the world, which is very, very important for, at least for cruise uh, industry. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, I will leave uh, the place and the, and the stand to Marika, which is the coordinator of the project, in order to discuss more about the solution. So Marika, you have uh, the stage. Oh, yes, oh, yes, thank, thank you, very, you much. very much. So I'm, so I'm just, just coming, coming back, back to the presentation. presentation. Here we go. So, so stemming, stemming from, from the analysis the that we carried out and we are carrying out right now in the in the project implementation at the proposal stage, we identified the possible solution. So um, the possible solution is, of course, related to the complexity of the Mediterranean basing. And building on that, um, the project you uh, eco cruising Futur um, initiative aims to address what are the common challenges in the Mediterranean, West Mediterranean basin, and to contribute the four to um, the achievement of three main goals as we detected during the analysis and the elaboration. So number one is a safer and more secure maritime space. Number two is a smart and resilient blue economy and how we can implement and even uh, more have this blue economy grow in, in, the, in the period, in the implementation period. And then, of course, also this is pretty much connected to the better governance of the sea. How we are going to do this then? Um, so we have in the project implementation three main building blocks. So the first one, uh, which was pretty much covered by Yanis in, the, in his presentation, is dealing with assessment analysis and strategic planning. 
Then we have uh, building block number two, which is really important and it deals with capacity building, so education and training. And then we have uh, the building block number three, uh, which is related to product development and testing. And let's see now in details. So block number one, um, the activities in, uh, in this block and related to pretty much uh, work package one and work package two in our project implementation are aiming at researching the market to understand the market, um, to understand the needs from the sector, uh, not only from the bus business per perspective, but also from visitors in order to understand the pains and gains. Uh, what, uh, what is the is goal, the goal? Uh, at, at the end? The, end, uh, the, the aim, aim is to elaborate a strategic plan for supporting uh, tourism, uh, SMEs, businesses, businesses in general from the West Mediterranean area, area uh, to, implement to implement more sustainable, sustainable practices into their business and afford to develop innovative and sustainable models. models. Um, in capacity building is more related to building block number two. Uh, this capacity building is actually split into different two different programs. If you want, the first one is more tailored to West Mediterranean SMEs and public and private organization. So we will have something that is very hands-on and practical, uh, a training program. Uh, specifically, specifically tailored to SMEs, SMEs needs about a few uh, potential topics. topics. We are, we are not, not still there in the implementation, so, so these are just tentative topics, topics that, that we are going, going to cover. cover. But in but all in all, all sustainability standards, standards uh, something, something related, related to environmental and natural resources, resources infrastructure and awareness, uh, green skills and blue skills, skills, skills or, or crisis and emergency, emergency management, which is really important considering the fact that the, the sector was hit very, very bad by, by the COVID-19 COVID um, pandemic. pandemic. Then we will have a masterclass series targeting uh, a different target groups. So in this case, group with companies uh, of different sizes, public and private organizations, DMOs, and this is um, because we want them uh, to be involved in the design and implementation of a more sustainable development path. So the master classes will be uh, about commitment, uh, responsible communication, sustainable tourism development plan, uh, just to list a few of them. And then finally, uh, when we have covered the assessment analysis in building block one, and then we have increased the uh, skills in building block two, we will be uh, designing a new, innovative, eco-smart cruise package, uh, of course, related to the cruise sector, targeting uh, an innovative, in a way, uh, target groups, which are millennials and Generation Z. So the idea is to offer innovative routes uh, and solution uh, paving the way towards the net zero for cruise and coastal areas, uh, but combining together smart, uh, which is meaning digital and eco-sustainable offering. So we will be offering participants nature-based tourism packages using possibly, of course, alternative zero impact means of transport to explore the destinations, and in the same way, um, rising awareness on the importance of fostering environmental and cultural understanding. Uh, this, uh, this package, package will have, have therefore, a smart component, considering the fact that we are targeting millennials and generation Z, so we will aim to have contact technology on board, uh, high-speed Wi-Fi, um, gaming or TV and cabin, which are pretty much features that this kind of uh, target groups are willing for. But at the same time, we will have an eco component. So as we mentioned before, uh, trying to raise awareness of the impact that the visitors had at destination. And so um, trying to go hand in hand with educating the traveler about the area history, the destination heritage and natural resources, and therefore to boost a responsible environmental stewardship and conservation. This is something that we will be doing uh, quite at the end of the project, and um, uh, we will try to test these uh, um, tourism packages uh, uh, using uh, uh, AR and VR. So we will have some uh, focus group from the target groups, uh, and we will, will be testing uh, the package in a virtual environment. And then uh, after the project implementation and conclusion, we will be, of course, launching um, the package on, onto the market. 
Um, and that's, and that's all, all from my side. side. So, so thank you once again for having us. us. Uh, and, and if you have a question, question, we are here, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marika. Thank you. Uh, as uh, we said, all questions uh, will be collected by us. You can ask through the uh, Teams channel and through Eventbrite. And I think we have one final presentation now. We finished with projects, but it's time to see what the Commission is, uh, is planning for the next year. And uh, I'm happy to have with us uh, Sonia Karasavizdo, our, our project officer, to present uh, the new EMFF course. Um, thank you, Andisa. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. Actually, after many years of not being able to travel and uh, being able to meet the project, uh, this is a good opportunity to meet all of you because uh, actually you, you managed to bring a lot of projects together. <laughs> uh, three of my projects are here, actually, the Blue Careers project, all Greek. And uh, also, uh, I ha we have the T4 uh, project that was presented before, that is closed now. Also, this Echo Cruising, I know that it's a flagship project that started now. And the, 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 the Greek projects that were presented, they are all very interesting. And, uh, and I'm very happy, as I said, uh, to see you all together here and to be able to, to have this opportunity to present to you the, the new funding opportunities from the side of the Commission. So um, today I was asked to present two, the two calls that are open, both the Blue Careers call for Sustainable Blue Economy and also the flagship uh, call. Um, I will start with the first one, the Blue Careers for Sustainable Blue Economy. Uh, initially we started with uh, 7 million euro EU contribution, but uh, it raised to seven and a half. Uh, which was uh, something very positive for you. Uh, uh, the Commission found more money that uh, we wanted to invest to skills. So we, we have this call that is open since the 13th of October, uh, as you know, and it's, uh, its deadline is the 31st of, uh, of January. Um. So, uh, as you know, this uh, Blue Careers Call is the third edition of the Blue Careers Call. We had uh, two more before and uh, <laughs> a small one in between. And uh, we created this infographic that you can see on the right, where uh, we show more or less what we did. We had 18 projects uh, with EU contribution of 11 million until now. Some of them are still open, finishing soon, and uh, tackle different sectors. And uh, the activities that you created, you, you proposed, and you delivered were very positive. I mean, also from what I heard today, I was very happy to see that our projects were, uh, all, although we had the pandemic, two years of, uh, of two difficult years, uh, we could see that uh, projects uh, delivered. Um, so this is very good, and um, you will see now that uh, the Commission is investing even more on skills uh, for the future. So uh, as I said, um, the current policies uh, also uh, give priority to, to skills. Um, and um, you can see, you, first of all, we have the, 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 this call that supports the Green Deal and the the initiative on, uh, on the, from the 2021 on EU approach for achieving a sustainable blue economy for a green recovery that addresses the challenges of the green and digital transition. And uh, one thing that I, I need to say that in October, another European Commission proposal was adopted to make the 2023 uh, the year of skills. 
uh, and there will be lots of events and uh, awareness raising campaigns uh, to support uh, EU skilling and uh, reskilling and also uh, new funding opportunities will be will be shown and uh, and you will you will hear more from from uh, from from us on, on this um, okay. what are the challenges you will see that uh, especially the the career schools that have uh, were uh, present in the previous call the 2018 call that uh, a lot of challenges are similar uh, we had in the past the lack of, uh, well, digital and green is new, but the rest is more or less the same. So we, the challenges are the lack of digital, green, uh, transversal, and also soft skills. And uh, I heard today that uh, on soft skills, uh, we, and I also heard from one-to-one uh, -one meetings with, uh, with the projects that uh, soft skills uh, are very, very important for graduates. Uh, so we need to invest on those uh, a lot um, to, to, to kind of uh, prepare the gen next generation of digital uh, blue skills uh, so that uh, students and workers can uh, seize upcoming opportunities. Um, now, uh, the lack of structured cooperation between industry and education and vet, vet, vet institutions uh, that is needed to promote uh, curriculate and uh, training uh, programs to exchange of programs uh, and that should be adapted to the to the gaps uh, of the of the job market so this is very important to bring together these two two players and again we are investing uh, we are we are asking you to come together and to to propose a new projects that will bring together industry and educational institutions uh, thirdly, the lack of skills ecosystem at sea base in level. Uh, the, this is uh, more to bring, bring together the different public authorities, but also uh, education uh, and, uh, and industry together at sea base in level. Um, and uh, thirdly, the lack of training certification and qualification and recognition processes which is something that you know, some of the projects have done, and it's, again, something that we want to see in the future. Um, our objectives. Uh, uh, this call aims to support innovative projects um, that would bring, as I said, together the industry, uh, the maritime academic institution, but also vocational trading providers. And what we want is to promote green and digital skills, uh, to boost uh, digitalization and greening of jobs, very important, to reskill and upskill, to bring, to promote reskilling and upskilling schemes, and, um, and cooperation between industry and education uh, to support uh, the labor force, the active labor force, and also to to bring, uh, 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 to bring uh, blue careers awareness and attractiveness of students and young professionals, to attract them and to retain them in the, in the job market. Um, uh, what are the themes and priorities? Uh, your proposals, your new proposals should uh, address at least one of the themes. Um, in the past we had uh, more, but now we want uh, one or a combination of those. Uh, and uh, what is also important is to, if, if possible, uh, to propose and to develop uh, a multidisciplinary approach in a variety of sectors. So not only one sector, but also to bring together different sectors uh, and also being mindful of gender dimension and uh, to further promote equality, diversity, and inclusion in the sector. It's something, or in the sectors, it's something that we, we always tend to say, and it's something that is an important factor for all the projects nowadays in of the Commission. Um, what are the themes now? Uh, to develop innovative material, educational material, to promote like new curricula, uh, again, enhance digital and green, 
also on soft skills, uh, interdisciplinary, managerial skills, um, develop, secondly, develop and pilot innovative teaching and training approaches in any sector. And uh, here I have to say that the Commission is very much looking into, um, into emerging sectors. So they are, for example, we have this uh, new initiative on algae, we have uh, biotechnologies, we have aquaculture, ecotourism, underwater technologies, ocean observation. Of course, I, I don't say that maritime, transport, ports, uh, and all the, the existing, the old, say, sectors are not important, and we need to, to focus on those too. But uh, there is clearly a focus and interest also on the, on the emerging sectors. Uh, to training on those. Uh, again, setting up a collaboration frameworks between industries uh, and education vet providers to promote uh, uh, curricula training programs uh, in line with the different develop de technological developments, um, and also adapted to the to the needs of the of the industry. Uh, pooling and sharing of resources, of platforms, of tools, of content of mobility, simulators, whatever different schemes, digital tools, whatever exists there, it's important to share. It's important to come together and to, to work together also at a regional level. Uh, so try to find partners that, could, uh, that you could work with and you could you could do those things because some of the projects have already developed something. So it's, it's very important to, to move forward with that and also try to share uh, the knowledge. Um, and lastly, uh, to propose, test, and pilot mutual recognition schemes um, yeah, to enable an efficient uptake of graduates into the labor market, which is uh, obviously what they need. Uh, Activities and solutions. This is a non-restrictive list of activities and solutions that we would like to see. Um, yes, we would like to see innovative training modules. I know that I'm very much repetitive, but this is the, the call that I'm presenting here. And I mean, we, we indeed had a lot of repetition in the, in the call text. I'm, most of you have read it. And uh, yeah, this is, this is the focus, so really. What we want to see is innovative training modules uh, on soft, green, digital, managerial, entrepreneurial, through a, a different means like uh, traditional trainings that you, you've done, uh, but also other trainings, hybrid teaching, e-learning, at both educational, uh, higher educational, but also vocational training level. Um, secondly, a uh, combination of training means for skills development at various levels again. Uh, as I said, different types of trainings to, to develop the, the, the skills that are out there, but also move forward with another, with a step forward. Um, operational links between academia and industry, indeed strength and operational cooperation between those. Uh, setting up, uh, training for trainers, for example, on-the-job trainings, apprenticeships, mentoring that we had uh, in other projects, uh, job shadowing schemes, including also career guidance. There are, there are lots of opportunities out there. And uh, I also invite you, as I said, to, to read the, the call text and get some more ideas on that. On that. Um, uh, last, uh, well, not, not last, uh, the pooling and sharing of resources. Again, what I said before, we would like to see uh, collaboration at regional level on how you share your resources between educations and vet institutions and the industry, of course, and different platforms, different tools, and different content that is developed there. Uh, on awareness raising campaigns, to upskill and reskill the blue economy operators that are out there, but also fishers. Uh, it's also important you not know, to forget them. Uh, one other thing that is maybe important to say is also to uh, encourage uh, circular approaches and sustainable and, and sustainable approaches in the blue economy, 
via different trainings. And we had, for example, in the past, a project on uh, uh, fishing for litter, for example, which is a very innovative thing. And we want to see this type of things. I mean, this uh, the, looking at the, the different needs in the sectors, uh, trying to find solutions uh, uh, solutions to that. Also on uh, different um, coast on coastal tourism, sustainable different practices that we have heard today, etc. But what is important is also not to to give up on, on, on trainings that are not working and to try to, 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 to bring innovative solutions and solutions that are, uh, are gonna help in, uh, in, uh, in, providing, in providing what we really want, to attract uh, newcomers to the different jobs, to different sectors. Um, now, the, the choice of uh, sectors, uh, um, it has to be based on an analysis of the needs of the labor market, including across border levels. So this is something that is also important you have to do, um, to analyze uh, the, the needs in the market uh, and also to look at the cross border level. Um, expected impacts. Uh, the the, project, uh, the projects will need to address solutions at, uh, as I said, local and regional level, at sea basin level, uh, in a variety of sectors if possible, with an accent on digital and green, uh, on reskilling, upskilling schemes. And the, the project uh, we expect to see, to deliver, are new content or new educational content and methodologies, uh, or increase awareness, and attractiveness, visibility in the different sectors, improve employability of students. And this is something we would put in the KPIs. It's important to, to have numbers because the commission is asking for numbers. We want to see that you have helped and in which direction, in which sector, and how this has been developed with the years. Um, and provide also hands-on experience and learning um, so a real thing, and also set up reskilling, upskilling uh, schemes and career guidance, uh, also very important. Um, what is what is what we want to see also in your proposals is a legacy plan. Um, so, legacy plan is, as you all know, what uh, what will be the outputs of the of the project, uh, how it will carry on in the future and uh, the sustain sustainability aspect of it. So it's also very important, uh, important for us. And the other also important factor is the, is, uh, is the synergies. Uh, today we are meeting all together and you had the chance to meet different projects and to, and to network and you have more chances in the afternoon and also tomorrow. And this is the whole idea. Uh, come together, try to find partners, and try to 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 bring ideas uh, and mingle, and uh, bring some new innovative projects to us because uh, this is what we're looking for. Um, and then we move to the eligibility conditions for this call. Um, so we, in order to be eligible, the, the beneficiary or the affiliated entity, because these two are the only entities that are receiving funding, uh, must be legal entities, so public or private, uh, be established in one of the eligible countries. And when I say eligible, I mean an EU member state, including the overseas countries and territories. And a list of non-EU countries is also there. So these countries that you see here are also eligible to apply. And I please go, I, I invite you to, to read the, the call text where you will find the, 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 the countries. Uh, we already received some questions uh, from uh, applicants uh, from other countries. And uh, just to just clarify here that uh, uh, other countries can be part of a project, but not as a funding uh, applicant. So they would be associated partners, but not, uh, uh, can be associated partners, but they cannot receive funding. So these are the countries that can receive funding. 
uh, on the consortium composition, um, we have uh, we need minimum three independent entities from two different countries. Can be of course more, can be more entities and more countries, uh, and include at least an educational organization, training organization. So it can be a university, can be an educational institution, a research center, or organization providing vocational training, or and sorry, an industry representative body. That can be a, an industry association, a representative group of industry, a chamber of commerce, or a maritime cluster, a legally established maritime cluster. Um, the coordinator must and has to be from a new member state. Uh, with regards to the geographical location, um, the proposals should relate to activities that are taking place in the EU territory and waters, and also in the, in the sea basins, the North Sea, the Baltic, the Black Sea, the Atlantic, and the Mediterranean, West Med and the Adriatic Ionian, and also the EU outermost regions. Also, you can have a focus on past part subregion, and the outermost regions are also something we, we want to see coming forward. I, we don't know if we will have proposals from that side, but uh, maybe some partners could, uh, could come from, from, that, from that region. Um, and as I said, uh, non-EU countries are not eligible for funding. So, so from the ones that are not in the list that I mentioned before. Now, uh, special attention um, should be given to the following. Like in the proposal, you will should clearly identify the, the theme and the priority that you are focusing on. You can have more than one, as I said, but uh, please mention it in the, in the proposal. Why I'm saying that is because uh, the, uh, in the evaluation, uh, we end up, um, well, it's not us, it's the, the external experts that are doing the job, and I will mention that further on, um, are um, looking at the, into that. So we cannot have uh, um, funding of uh, seven proposals in the same theme. So we'll try to have a mix of different themes and priorities. So this is why uh, if you have a mix of themes, it's, it's good because you would cover more and uh, you would have more opportunities for funding. Design, of course, the, your actions with the industry representatives, very important because this is what we need. Uh, try to develop regional partnerships at sea basin level, try to see what are the needs, what are the skills needs at, at, the, a, at sea basin level, um, and also at sector level. So uh, a geographical representation, but also in the different sectors at, at that, at that, uh, in that uh, region, let's say. Um, and uh, one other thing that is also important to mention is the, that the proposals should also take into account, account other initiatives commission initiatives and different policies that are out there and our strategies are, that are out there. And when I say different policies, I mean the um, sea base and macro regional strategies. It's something that it's, it's important to, to take into account. Uh, the future EU algae initiative. Uh, these are priorities of the commission. These are things that are important to uh, that are a, a kind of a priority for them. And they, they want to see um, also this call being directed towards that direction. So for you to know that this is, a, yeah, proposals of this kind would, uh, would be seen in a more uh, positive um, way. Um, also the aquaculture um, guidelines should be also taken into account. There are some agricultural guidelines that are um, out there for the period 21-30. Also, please uh, consider that policy. Um, as I said, uh, what is important is um, for your project to liaise and conduct activities that are will create complementarities and synergies with projects 
that were funded before, not only MFF, for, of course also MFF, but uh, also other programs from the, from the other programs, Erasmus, Tetra, Horizon, uh, there are different projects out there that uh, is important to, to look at those and try to, to create uh, complementarities. And uh, as I said, also to the, to the extent possible, proposals should engage to, with partners across different sea basins and also as far as relevant from autonomous regions. And uh, why we, we put autonomous regions there is because uh, the, they, 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 these countries face additional challenges because they are remote and they miss the necessary you know, uh, opportunities that uh, other countries have. So it's, uh, for us, it's, it's, it's important to, to see also projects, if possible, having partners from that region. And uh, here is to sum up uh, the Blue Careers call. Uh, we who can apply? First, we want to have a consortium of at least three applicants from two different countries. And this is a minimum. You can have more, as I said. How much can you get? The co-funding rate is 80%. Um, we have projects of, uh, expect to have projects of two or three years. Uh, and also the project should be around uh, 800,000 to 1 million 200. Your contribution is around that. Uh, we have a seven and a half million budget. So uh, around that, we, we we, we expect to see to see proposals coming um, coming uh, coming uh, our way. Uh, and what are we looking for? Indeed, uh, we we want innovative projects, cooperation projects, bringing together industry representatives and also educational and training organizations. Um, and with this, I finish with uh, the Blue Careers call. And I move to the next call that is also published on the 13th of uh, October, was published, and the deadline is also the 31st of January. And that is original flagships projects in EU sea basins. Um, the, this, uh, the budget for this, for this uh, flagship call is of uh, 7,600,000 euros. And we have six topics. Uh, today I will not present all the topics because I, I thought that uh, the, the audience is not really interested in all the topics. So I am mainly focusing on three, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. That is topic two, topic three, and topic four. Uh, so first, uh, just an overview. We have the first uh, topic is the uh, diversification, right, diversification of fisheries activities in the Atlantic area, which is topic one with uh, two million. Harnessing preparedness and response to marine pollution in the Black Sea, which is uh, topic two with uh, 600 euros. Sustainable transport and ports in the Mediterranean, topic three with 2,400,000. Maritime clusters as an innovative enabler for sustainable blue economy in the Med, uh, topic four with one million. Sustainable maritime and coastal tourism in the autonomous regions, uh, topic five with one million again. And uh, regenerative ocean farming in the Baltic Sea region, topic six with 600. So as I said, I will focus on uh, the Mediterranean and the Black uh, Sea. Um, starting from the Mediterranean, uh, I said, as I said, you have 80% uh, co-funding rate here. Um, contribution to the project should be around 400 to 1 million. The overall budget for the MED is 3 million 500, and for the per topic is 2 400 for topic 3 and 1 million for topic 4. And what are we looking for here is uh, development of green shipping sustainable transport and ports, and support to the innovation of maritime clusters in the West uh, Mediterranean area. These are the two topics uh, in one. Um, so what are the objectives per topic? Uh, first of all, the first topic is on the sustainable transport and ports in the Med, topic three. 
with, an, with a budget of 2,400,000. .4 and the objective is to reduce emissions by ports and ships and promote the transition towards carbon neutrality in the maritime transport sector in the Met while ensuring synergies with the Horizon Europe co-programmed partnership of zero emission waterborne transport. This is, was clearly taken from the, from the call text. Um, and I will come back to what we are really looking, looking to see under that. The objective for, for, um, for topic uh, four, the maritime clusters as an innovative enabler for a sustainable blue economy in the Med, uh, to foster an effective network of maritime clusters across the Med, in order to support medium, small, and micro enterprises in the blue economy. And then going back again to topic three, we have the different, the, what is the scope and what are the different themes. We, we want to have, we want to see, uh, this is an indicative list, so again, uh, the call text provides uh, only an indicative list and it's not exhaustive, uh, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, but where I will name you a few themes uh, that I, I see interesting, and I, I have listed them here, and there is more in the call text, as I said, and I invite you to, to go back to the call and, and, and read that. So monitoring um, and technology foresight on green shipping in the MED, yeah. Um, then what we want to see here, that the activities that we want to see here under this monitoring technology foresight on green shipping is, um, for example, a market analysis and supply chain mapping to monitoring of emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions, of sulfur and um, particulate matter, etc. So uh, an example. Then uh, on, on number two, promotion of energy communities in, in ports of the Mediterranean. Uh, an example for that, uh, we can support, for example, the transition from the LNG uh, towards uh, an altern alternative fuels like uh, green hydrogen, electricity, uh, wind, uh, wind energy. Uh, so things like that that could indeed uh, be part of this, uh, of this, um, under this, uh, under this uh, theme, and uh, could be an idea, an idea for you. Now, under under the, th the third one, promote commercial vessels. Um, under this sim th theme, uh, projects may cover an um, an assessment of the options for energy investment, addressing the needs for short-term investment and cost structure for adaptation. Uh, so, I mean, this is just an example, but there, there may be more, more, to, more, more on that, and, uh, and as I said, I invite you to go back to it and, and read more on this. Um, now, sustainable transport ports, and what are the impacts? Uh, Again, as we have said, uh, the, the linking into the activities, uh, we want to see full mapping of needs and capacities across the shore of the Med with a systemic view of the maritime transport, uh, setting the basis for the creation of energy communities, establishment of an observatory on technologies and source to be used for green shipping, uh, training capacity, uh, technical and managerial skill on sustainable maritime transport and energy efficiency in shipping, and also harmonization and standardization of technologies and regulations, as well as sharing of knowledge, good practices and capacity across the region. So these are some of the expected impacts uh, on, on that under, under topic three. Under topic four, we have the Maritime clusters as an innovation enabler for a sustainable blue economy in the Med. And uh, this topic focuses on uh, new, creating new national maritime clusters and enhancing cooperation between northern and southern clusters, and also aims to improve the involvement of maritime clusters in policy making at, at regional level and at national level. And what kind of activities can be funded uh, under that is, uh, again, a non-exhaustive list. Um, 
establishing new national maritime clusters, organizations, for example, across the Med, enhanced cooperation between northern and uh, southern maritime clusters that are already there, existent, uh, or promote cooperation between um, key actors of maritime clusters like uh, business, research, education, and training institutions, etc. This is very, very similar to careers. I mean, you could call, link it to careers, uh, this uh, specific topic. And, um, and then what are the expected impact? We expect to see, to strengthen competitive, com the competitiveness of the maritime clusters, to enhance cooperation among the, the clusters, existing clusters and financial institutions and between the different SMEs and academia and research centers, increase participation of coastal stakeholders, improve governance structures of clusters and management of skills, and, um, and also create maritime clusters at the Mediterranean level and between the different partners across. Um, this was something that was added afterwards. I, I didn't have the, the chance uh, to, 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 to add it before, but in any case, uh, I know that there may be an interest in the black screen from your side, so uh, topic three is on harnessing and preparedness and response to marine pollution in the Black Sea. And the objective for this uh, topic is to preparing and adapting the cap capacity for a coordinated response to new challenges linked to marine pollution, with particular attention to armed conflict. And also the scope is to identify specific types and impacts of marine pollution, including pollution caused by armed forces, armed forces as I said, and um, and then uh, the expected impact is to improve the capacities of the different authorities and different organizations to cooperate at two basic levels and to implement training schemes on sea pollution, uh, including pollution caused by armed conflict, and while integrating the expertise and the different best practices from other EAP basins. Uh, so this is what we expect to see under the Black Sea uh, topic uh, three. And what are the eligibility conditions for this uh, call? For this uh, call and for those three topics, uh, we have the again the beneficiaries and the affiliated entities must be legal entities, public or private. Uh, should be established in one of the eligible countries, and when we say eligible countries, we again mean the EU member states, including overseas countries and territories, and we have a list of non-EU countries that are part of the sea basin strategies and, uh, and the regional cooperation frameworks that are targeted in this call, and I have for topic three and four the list of countries that for the Mediterranean that are eligible, and for topic two, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and Turkey that are the four eligible countries to apply uh, under the Black Sea topic too. Now on specific uh, cases, I, 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 I don't know if you wanna, you wanna go into that, uh, it's more kind of what, well, the, again, on the eligibility and the different uh, types of uh, uh, persons that or entities that could apply. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're interested in that at this moment, uh, but uh, I, mean, I invite you to, to go to the call text and see. Uh, we will have more, more uh, interaction also at the info day that I will mention uh, later. What I wanted to say that, uh, ah, the consortium composition. Important to mention that uh, again here for, uh, we, we expect to have again three applicants, beneficiaries or uh, affiliated entities, which, uh, sorry, uh, three applicants uh, for uh, minimum three independent entities from th two different countries for all the topics. And for topic two, three, and four that we were discussing, so for the Met and the Black Sea, at least one entity from a non-EU eligible country, so from the list of countries that I mentioned before. Uh, the coordinator should always be from an EU member state. 
as regards the geographical location. Um, okay, the, of course, the, the proposals related to the activities concerning the Med Sea and the Black Sea. Um, of course, they can also focus on uh, sub-regions of, of the different sea basins, uh, sea basin areas. Um, they can also normally relate to EU waters, but they can also extend into neighboring waters if this is necessary for the implementation of, the, of, the, of their project. Um, moving on to award and evaluation. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the way we do the evaluation in the commission, but uh, we have uh, those three criteria. And so we are looking at the relevance, the quality, and the impact of, the, of your proposals. And this is a minimum score and the maximum score, and we have overall pass score of 21. Uh, in, the, in the evaluation, we always use uh, external experts for this course. And we're currently, I'm currently, <laughs> In, uh, in the process of uh, selecting external experts uh, from a pool of uh, experts that we have uh, that are going to do this work. So we are monitoring, we are, we are monitoring the work that they are doing, of course, but they are the ones that are doing really the evaluation. So they are uh, external experts um, that are evaluating your project. It's very important for you to look into these uh, three award criteria because uh, there are only three. <laughs> And uh, the, the importance of impact, for example, I mentioned it uh, at some point today to someone, uh, the impact of your proposal is, uh, it will be evaluated and, uh, and it, it should be seen from the beginning, like from before when you, when you propose, uh, not, uh, not waiting for the end of the proposal to, to see if there, there was an impact. So you have to think beforehand what would be the, your impact. Um, and also the quality or and the and the relevance and the importance also the link it to the different uh, priorities and the different themes uh, mentioned uh, i forgot to mention that the award criteria and the uh, and the evaluation as such is identical for both calls so it's uh, both for careers and the flagship call um, we have a one step evaluation um, the i mentioned already the focus on themes and priorities that is important. So don't forget to mention that in your proposal. Or what I also like to say is that uh, we try to have um, an equal geographical coverage. Uh, so when evaluating uh, at the end, and we have a list of uh, say 15 good proposals, we and we have to fund 10 then we need to see what is the geographical um, uh, coverage and to have a balance. Uh, not to have, for example, 10 Mediterranean projects and uh, one Atlantic and one Black Sea or whatever. So they try to have uh, as, as much as this is possible, um, some kind of uh, uh, balance between on that. Um, This is the indicative timing, timeline for, for us. Um, as you know, uh, the call is open, the calls are open, and the, our deadline is the 31st of uh, January. Um, as soon as this is done, this, as soon as we close the call, we will um, start the, the evaluation. We will already have the external experts uh, with the contracted so we we'll start the evaluation that should uh, last uh, around um, three months in total. Um, that can be less. And um, we also agree on the ranking list at the end. The ranking list, as I said, we look at this geographical coverage and we look at this balance and all that, also the themes. Um, and um, the, by May, we expect to, to send the information on the evaluation results. And uh, in September, October, we should uh, normally sign the, the new grants. I also invite you to go to the CINEA MFAF page and also, also to the Funding and Tender Opportunities Portal. There you will also be able to find uh, matchmaking 
partners. So maybe you find some partners that you could uh, work with, and uh, and I invite you. There is a list uh, there, and you invite you to go to go and look for that. And also, please, if you have any questions, uh, you can always use the functional mailbox. We will officially reply to you. We are obliged to reply in two weeks. So in two weeks, you will have an official reply on a question that you don't understand something on the call or whatever. Um, so please do that. And um, last but not least, uh, we have an info day on the 24th of November in two weeks' time, which will be physical, but also uh, on a hybrid mode. So we hope, I heard that already some of you will be there, so I'm very happy. Uh, and um, you're all invited, of course. Uh, it's an opportunity to meet uh, people, also partners, future partners, and also to meet the commission officials and also to discuss with them I don't know, in official, unofficial way um, any, any, any questions you have or uh, um, also ideas. I mean, we're there to, and I should say also that uh, we also have the financial colleagues uh, there that we can also provide you with any financial questions, uh, uh, financial replies to your questions. So please, uh, uh, please uh, follow us on the info day. And if you're not able to come, it will be on a hybrid mode. So there will be a slide uh, that will be functioning from the whole day. So you will can pose your questions there and we will of course answer your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much for uh, taking the opportunity and presenting the new calls. I'm sure that uh, we found a lot of um, new ideas and opportunities uh, today, and I'm sure that we will have some uh, new calls, new proposals for you uh, coming January. Uh, I'd like to thank the speakers, first of all, for respecting the timeline of 15 minutes that I gave them. Uh, sometimes it can be rough, I know. And uh, now we have uh, a buffet outside where we can further discuss and uh, meet each other. Thank you all for coming here. Th I'd like to thank the online participants as well. And. Uh <laughs>